This is Ralph Rensler, director of the Smithsonian Bicentennial Folklife Festival. If you enjoyed the festival, you'll be interested in this invitation. Ladies and gentlemen, an opportunity like this cannot be taken for granted. This evening, we are going to be beating our hearts out for you all, so I want to see people enjoying themselves. So get up and feel the music and do something about it, okay? This event is a right of cultural democracy. We have many, many partners, you included. I encourage you to stand alongside with us as we travel this journey year after year. Welcome to Corn, Beans, and Squash, What the Three Sisters Tell Us, a part of Beyond the Mall from the Smithsonian Folklife. Thank you for joining us. We are offering real-time captioning and American Sign Language interpretation for today's program. To view, the simulca to view the simulcast that includes these services, please use the link provided in the comments section. My name is Mandy Van Hooflin, and I'm Mini Koju Lakota and a member of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe in South Dakota. I manage the Cultural Interpreter Program at the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C. Today, I invite you to participate in a conversation that explores the traditional planting of corn, beans, and squash, also known as the Three Sisters, which has sustained many indigenous cultures throughout the Western Hemisphere for thousands of years. We'll be taking your comments in the live chat, so I encourage you to participate. This event is sponsored by the Smithsonian Conservation Commons and Earth Optimism and provided in partnership with the National Museum of the American Indian. If you aren't familiar with the festival, I encourage you to check out festival.si.edu to learn about our programs, education resources, and more. But before we begin, I would like to gratefully acknowledge the native peoples on whose ancestral homelands we gather, as well as the diverse and native vibrant communities who make their homes here today. Now I'd like to welcome our guests and my colleagues, Christine Price Abelo, Renee Goki and Hayes Levis. Executive Chef Freddie Batsui isn't able to be here with us today, but we appreciate his contributions to this program. So I'm gonna ask each of you to introduce yourselves, starting with Christine. Hi, I'm Christine Avalo. I'm the horticulturalist at the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian. And Hayes? Good afternoon, my name is Hayes Levis. I am the museum program specialist. I do programming for the museum, and I, a lot of it focuses on food and landscape. Good day, everyone. My name is Renee Goki. I'm the teacher and student services coordinator at the National Museum of the American Indian. And over the 20 years that I've been here, I've done a variety of programs and resources for teachers, students, and sometimes when I'm lucky, families. Great, it's so good to see you all today uh, in this virtual world. I miss seeing you in person. But uh, we're going to start today with Renee, who is going to share us a, share with us a traditional Shawnee story about the origin of corn. Great. So this story actually it it was originally an oral tradition, which means it was only told. But back in 1934, a woman named Ermine Wheeler Vogelin, who was a cultural anthropologist who studies cultures, and she went to our Shawnee communities. And she was told this story by a woman, an absentee Shawnee woman named Nancy Skye. And when I came across this story, I thought it was just a really rich story. And so um, I came across the, the recording of it and I thought that it would be a good story to share back with our community. So this is a community uh, story. It was sort of many Shawnee people contributed to this and Carrie Silverhorn, who's also Eastern Shawnee, was the illustrator of the story. Um, just for a little background, our tribe's originally from the Ohio River Valley um, and, and many different state jet, states actually, but today we find our homes in Northeast Oklahoma and um, also in sort of central Oklahoma around Shawnee, Oklahoma. 
So the story starts with the present day and you see the cover here, the story of our corn. You'll notice that uh, this woman has her hands outstretched and she's actually corn woman. And the story starts really with today. So Kokuchi is in the kitchen and she has, she's getting dinner ready. And she calls to the kids, she says, Wathiniko, and Wathiniko means time to eat. She says, Hapaji, hurry up. And so the kids come, they'd helped her prepare some cornbread and they come back into the kitchen and the kids start to sort of tussle over a piece of cornbread and some of the cornbread falls to the ground and she says, this isn't the right way to behave. Let me tell you a story about a long time ago when um, the, the corn left our people and what we had to do to get it back. So, so that's her telling them. Now what we're gonna do today um, is I'm gonna use a, a technique I learned, a storytelling technique from when I was growing up by a man named Brett Florendo. So you actually will become part of the story. So when I say, uh, you say, nah. We're gonna practice, uh, nah. No. Uh, nah. No. Good, good. Okay, so let's get on to the story. So a long time ago, the Shawnee people have plenty of food. In the early spring, people began planting our three sisters, corns, beans, and squash. And you can see the, the corn actually drying here. So long time ago, or traditionally, we would braid it, and we sometimes still braid our corn today to dry it. It was also on the roofs of the homes underneath the hot sun to dry it out, and people would move their hands. Sometimes kids, I've been told, would put their hands and turn the corn over. And it was always taken in at dusk because it's important to dry your foods very well for the winter. Now, traditionally, too, pumpkins were very important, or wapiko. And these pumpkins were cut into slices and, and rings, and they were smoked over the fire for winter. So long ago, Shawnee people had plenty. Well, one day, a girl walks by the cornfields and she hears some crying. A man has pushed over a woman, woman because he was angry from not catching any fish that day. This is very different than the way that Shawnee boys and men are taught. We have a lot of respect for men's and women's roles in our culture. And so she returns home and she tells grandma that she had heard some crying in the cornfield. When they return back to the cornfield, she brings her Kokuchi, her grandmother, and she brings her, her, her mother, Nikia. Huh? No. And you see here, when they come back, there's the corn starting to turn brown and dry out. And they see tracks, moccasin tracks and animal tracks leaving. And so they know that something has gone wrong. They have a problem. So mother corn, because she leaves the people, it's sunny and dry and there's uh, no water for the corn. So they bring a council of people together to talk about what should we do for this corn? And they decide, of course, they've been praying about it for a long time and trying new techniques. You know, traditionally we'd have our crops along the river banks, so the rich nutrients from the river can help to water the plants. We also planted things together, um, companion planting. And we have lots of different varieties. So certain women would have a variety of corn and they would separate so they wouldn't cross pollinate. So different families grew different varieties. Well, even now they have this problem because the men, they go out for uh, wild potatoes, they find pumpkins with seeds that won't grow. And this problem goes on for days, weeks, and months. So finally, after uh, one council, two women are leaving the council house and they see Wathiake, and you see a little boy here with beams of light. So Wathiake means light, sun. And so you see this, this boy here, and the women said, what should we do about this problem? He said, you know, I've, I've been listening and I think I know what to do, um, but you have to trust in me. I know I'm just a young boy. And the elder women, um, they, they wondered, does he have the answers for us? He said, you know, we see this light though, we see power in the light. So we believe in this young boy. And so what Thea Kay says, here's what I need you to do. Gather five good hunters who are uh, good protectors of our people. And I'd like you to make them moccasins. And I'd like you to make me a pair of moccasins as well for our journey. So the women select five men. And you see in this picture by Carrie, you see the different varieties of um, traditional clothing over different time periods, as well as um, hunting tools and implements. And you also see our center seam moccasins that we still wear today. Huh? No. No. Huh? 
No. no. Very good. All right. So they they make the moccasins and the men go on a journey. And they go and they journey for six nights and they arrive up. And this is where the story gets um, a little bit magical, but they get they, they arrive up in the sky world and they come to the creator's place in the woods. It's a big bark house that you'll see in a moment with barrels of food around it. There are pumpkins and squash and corn that are dried in the barrels. And you see this sort of neepy or water coming down from her house and she's sweeping in the yard. So this is actually Kukumthana and Kukumthana in our way in Shawnee is our, um, is our creator figure. And she's a female in the Shawnee way. And she listens to the men and she, they tell what happens and she tries to get to the origin or the root of the problem. And what she figures out is they go back in time and they figure out that maybe there was an imbalance when the man pushed that woman who was actually the corn spirit at the time. And so she says, we have to come back into balance with our people and I will return the seeds to you. So the men agree and she feeds each of the men, the three sisters in a wooden bowl. Now, this is also, uh, I think a, a neat part of the story that Nancy Skye told. There's only one kernel of Dami or corn only one kernel of Bisco Kikithi, or one bean, and one pumpkin seed, or Wapiko seed. So they said, certainly we can't get full from just three seeds. And she says, if you believe in me and, and eat these foods and return to these ways of balance and respect for each other, you'll see what will happen. And so they start to eat the food and more appears. And so they're full with this food. So at this time, she gives them more instructions on how to provide dances and show joy for these foods and give uh, respect and thankfulness for them to honor them, not only in the growing, but the harvesting, taking the plants, knowing how to dry them, knowing how to use them and, and grow them again for, for families and for future generations. Now at this time, Kukumthana provides different seeds to each person. To one hunter, she provides white seeds for bread. Another hunter receives uh, red hominy corn, the third white beans, the fourth pumpkins, and uh, the other man cucumber seeds. Finally, the, the um, little boy receives a, a deer hide bag and it has all the different seeds in it and she hands that to the boy, Wathiake. She opens the window in the sky and this is where if you can kind of imagine in your mind she opens the window in the sky and shows them a view of the men on earth. And she calls all the birds and the, uh, she feeds the eagles and the hawks and actually I have a red tail hawk I found this morning. I think it's red tail hawk. Um, and so imagine all these flapping wings with the birds. And she, that's also a Shawnee way is that you feed the animals and the birds. So the men return home to their Shawnee village. And from the story they share um, the lessons and traditions that they learned from Kukum Thana. They learned not to waste uh, or lose the Shawnee seeds again, and that we should plant these seeds in Mother Earth, that everyone should plant and there will be plenty for the people. And we believe in our Shawnee way that if we keep growing these foods and continuing the ceremonies that the Shawnee people have done to honor these three sisters and other foods, that we will prosper. Prosper means we will live well, we will live uh, in a good way. No much toe. That's the end of my story. Renee, thank you so much for sharing that Shawnee story of uh, corn. And I think I really loved how relevant the lesson of that story is still today to honor those three sisters so that the Shawnee will prosper and live in a good way. That's a really positive message. Uh, the Shawnee and many other indigenous communities have known and understood the health benefits of the Three Sisters for a very long time. So now I want to turn the conversation to Christine, who helped support Michelle Obama's Let's Move Indian Country initiative, which was all about health and well-being. Christine, would you be able to share more with us? Sure. Um, thank you. Yeah, in just a minute, we're going to show a video clip. Uh, the video was actually taken in 2011 in the White House Kitchen Garden. And it features Michelle Obama with a group of school children planting a three sisters garden there. And um, as the horticulturalist at the National Museum of the American Indian, um, I actually provided the plants and the seeds, the same ones that we grow in our garden, 
um, for the White House um, several years while they did the Three Sisters Garden there. Thanks. This is a very special day for the White House Kitchen Garden because in addition to harvesting some of the lettuces, we got rhubarb, we've got broccoli that's ready, so we're going to be able to get a lot done, but we're also going to do a Three Sisters planning today because last week we launched uh, a special new part of our Let's Move initiative called Let's Move Indian Country. And we're working specifically with young kids in the Native American community all across the country. Uh, and this planning is a, a special way to highlight uh, that new initiative. The idea for the three sisters, as we call it, they're, they're interconnected. The three sisters are beans, squash, and corn. And they work together to, to protect each other and to help each other grow. That's why we call them the three sisters. So today we're going to plant those. Nice job. We're going to try to make sure that all you kids grow up healthy, knowing what to eat, knowing how to exercise. It's a whole initiative to work with people all across the country to think about how we eat and how we move our bodies so that you guys grow up healthy and strong and able to do well in school and be successful in life. That's what the whole Let's Move effort is about. Christine, what a great initiative to be a part of um, as the horticulturalist at Smithsonian Gardens that works with three sisters all the time. Um, for those of you who are watching who haven't visited the National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C., the grounds that surround our museum are really considered an extension of the building. And they're inspired by the natural uh, and um, indigenous local environment uh, surrounding um, Washington, D.C. In our habitats, we have a traditional croplands area, which incorporates traditional irrigation and agricultural techniques. Christina, I was hoping you could tell us a little bit more about companion gardening and how corn, beans, and squash are planted in the landscape of the National Museum of the American Indian. Um, sure, Mandy. I actually um, just walked into the office a little while ago. I was working in the garden this morning, trying to plant some of the vegetables in the cropland area and even the squash in our um, Three Sisters garden today. Um, we usually do three rotations a year of our um, uh, in our cropland. We do our fall vegetables, which overwinter. Um, then we do our spring crops, which are usually cover crops and greens, things like uh, collards, kale, spinach, and then we do our summer crops, which are the ones I'm working on right now. That's usually our three sisters garden, our sunflowers, our tomatillas, chili pepper collection, um, peanuts, potatoes, uh, tomatillas, um, sweet potatoes. So uh, just a real assortment of, of native traditional food crops out there. These are all ethnobotanical plants. They have uses, whether it's food, fiber, dye, or medicine. And we're growing all of these plants organically. We're using IPM practices, integrated pest management techniques on them instead of chemicals um, so that's safe and um, healthy for people to eat uh, this food and, and we can grow it in a safe way too. The Three Sisters Garden that you can see um, on the screen here, this is a type of companion planting. It's corn, beans, and squash that we grow. And with companion planting, it means that the plants do well, kind of benefit each other, and actually um, function as a unit together to produce more yield or grow healthier um, that way. This is an example where the corn is a trellis um, that grows tall and strong and kind of supports the beans, which are nitrogen fixing and add nutrients back to the soil. And then the squash, which will be planted later, um, shades and kind of uh, keeps the roots cool and protects the plants from uh, animals because uh, it has the spines on the leaves there. There's a lot of different companion techniques and plants that you can use in your own gardens at home. I know a couple of them that are trendy and you, you know hear a lot about are like um, growing peppers and tomatoes together, tomatoes with basil, um, uh, 
marigolds and bringing in flowers for pollinators, things like that are all examples of companion plantings. Um, the benefits of the companion planting, it can be, um, you know, a chemically a change to produce more yield on the plants. It could be supporting the plants physically. It could also help with aerating the soil. If you were to grow something like, um, you know, carrots with onions or that kind of thing where you're loosening up the soil with those types of vegetables. It also helps um, schedule plants and get more rotations of crops in a small area if you can uh, grow more than one thing at a time that way. So um, each year in our landscape, uh, usually in May or maybe April, we'll start cleaning up the beds and removing our winter crops. And I'm still kind of working on that now. Um, and then for the Three Sisters Garden, we'll make uh, large round berms or mounds that are about four to five feet across. I'll usually plant the corn on there. I usually plant it in the cardinal directions. Uh, north, south, east, and west. You can kind of see from the picture there and one in the center. So it actually looks like a plus symbol. And when I plant it, I usually plant several seeds in each hole um, in case squirrels or animals uh, come and eat some of the seeds. We're still going to get germination on the plants. And if it's too many, I can always thin them out um, later if need be. I let the corn usually grow in for about three weeks. When it's around 12 to 18 inches high, I'll come in and plant the beans in between the corn plants. So there's usually four um, beans planted on each berm, and then I'll let those grow in for about three weeks as well, and then plant the squash on the flat ground area. I usually only plant a couple of squash plants though, because they can be um, quite aggressive and grow quickly. So that kind of gives the beans and the corn a head start before the squash might overtake. Um, the garden. So I think the scheduling and the timing and kind of spacing the plants out is the key um, in this area for getting a good crop. One thing to keep in mind, um, I know people are watching from all around the um, country, but in the DC area here, we tend to get a lot of heavy uh, thunderstorms in the springtime with a lot of rain coming quickly. And that's why I use the berms um, that allows the water to drain away from the seeds and kind of keep the roots from rotting out or seedlings from rotting out. But in other areas of the country where it's dry, they might do something like a waffle garden technique. The beds are actually uh, burned up in rows with sunken areas for planting. You plant in the low areas to direct and sort of collect that water into more of the plants um, in some areas of the country. And, um, you know, we've been doing this garden for 15 years now since we opened the museum. So we've kind of perfected the plants that we're gonna grow here in DC, which may not be the ones that everyone in other parts of the country would grow. As far as seed selection and things like that, I usually grow um, Cherokee White Eagle is the corn variety that we grow. It's a type of dent corn. That means it's, um, ground, it's usually dried and ground up for meal or flour. Um, it's a red kernel with a white marking on the side of it. And it has like an indentation when it dries on the tip of the kernel. And the markings on it are supposed to resemble uh, eagle's heads. And that's how it got the name of Cherokee White Eagle. And the beans that we grow are rattlesnake beans. that are a type of pole bean that uh, wind around the corn plants. The pods themselves are um, green and purple kind of variegated. And if you look at them quickly or they're moving in the breeze a little bit, they actually do like look like little snakes sort of hanging down on the plants. And that's where the name came from. And our squash that we grow is called Seminole pumpkin um, from the Seminole tribe. It, they would actually grow these in their hammocks and let it grow up the trees and then they could um, cut down the squash. The squash would never actually be touching the ground, so it wouldn't rot or anything like that with this particular variety. And I like this one because it um, stores well. I've had some that I've kept for a long time um, in the land in my office area. It um, keeps well, and they would be a food source for a long time. So, so thanks. That's a, our garden.
Thank you, Christine. That you just really shared a wealth of information. I think it was really informative. If people are thinking of starting their own um, three sisters garden, and I know from uh, my experience, just walking past the landscape for a, a small area, we produce a lot of food uh, that that is actually harvested. And I wondered if you could tell us more about how that food is harvested and used. Sure. Um... As I mentioned in the first part, all the food and plants in our landscape are grown organically. So we're able to use the produce in the Mitsutam Cafe, uh, which is great. These plants um, in the picture here, you can see our kitchen staff planting chili peppers actually in a waffle garden pattern. But the plants are produced at our greenhouse facility and then they're sent down uh, to, ready for us to plant in the ground. If the chefs um, have any special recipes or anything they're planning on making in the upcoming menu, they'll usually let me know the varieties they want to plant. I'll order them about six or eight months ahead of time so we can grow them out and have them ready to plant. And we've also done that with some of the exhibits of the Inca Road exhibit in particular. Um, usually what I do is I have the kitchen staff all come out to the garden one morning. I give them a little presentation about what we're growing, how we plant the plants properly, loosening up the roots and the soil level and watering them in, all of that kind of thing. And I explain to them exactly what we're growing because for some people, um, they may not know, you know what a tomato plant looks like or a pepper plant looks like. So it helps them get oriented and have buy-in into the garden as well. And then I have volunteers who help me maintain the plants throughout the season. And then I monitor the plants when they're ready to be harvested. I'll let the kitchen know they can send the staff out and I let them pick the peppers or pick the herbs and squash and things like that when they're ready and use them in the cafe. I um, just invite them out and they have a little control over the landscape too, which is great. Well, that's really great to know and I appreciate you sharing um, with everyone here today. So thank you, Christine, for that. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting to learn about how those plants are uh, cultivated and how they're used. And of course, as we're talking about these foods, you might be wondering how to prepare them. And knowing that they make their way into dishes at the Mitzi Tom Cafe, we wanted to talk a little bit more about how you can prepare that food. And just so our viewers know, Mitzi Tom is actually a Delaware or Lenape word that means let's eat. So I'm going to turn the conversation now to Hayes and he's going to talk a little bit more about one way you can prepare a dish using the three sisters. But before that Hayes, I'm wondering if you could answer one of the questions we had from a viewer which is about the harvesting and um, cultivation of these crops whether or not that is a communal activity or if it is done individually within different cultures. I'm wondering if you could answer that before you share the recipe. Hi, Mandy, certainly. Um, I would say the answer, it, is, it depends on the community that's involved. All the communities have different ways of doing it. Um, for example, in the Zia Pueblo culture, the women own the seeds, but the men are responsible for the planting. Um, in other communities, it may be a particular person or, or that, that does the planting. So the answer is it really depends on the community. And uh, then bridging over to it, I've had the pleasure of working with the, many of the executive chefs of the Mitzitown Cafe since we first started doing the food programs in 2006. Um, our current executive chef is Freddie Bitsui. He is our first native chef and he is from the Navajo Nation. And before we go too far in the recipe, there's just a couple of things we want to share with you. While many indigenous people grew corn, beans, squash together, the Iroquois are generally uh, attributed with naming the system the Three Sisters. Uh, each community has its own stories about these plants. The common thread is that the sisters were very close and stronger together than they were apart. And eating the corns, beans, squash together, as many of the indigenous populations have done over history, um, it enhance, enhances the nutritional benefits of each. Together, the complementary amino acids of the three sisters form a complete protein, minimizing the need, need for meat in the diet, especially during the long winters. Also, the traditional white corn contains a slow-release carbohydrate that is now believed to help prevent and regulate diabetes, a quality that our more uh, hybridized yellow corn lacks, even though it is absolutely delicious. 
Um, we have a couple of cafe of cookbooks that we have with the cafe as well. Our first cookbook, which is our inaugural cookbook, um, was created. It's Food of the Americas, Native Recipes and Traditions. And then the one that I'm sharing the recipe from is the Mitzitam Cafe cookbook that was done under one of our executive chefs, Richard Hessler. These are all available on our website. Uh, if you go to NMAI, there's our publications department has done an absolutely amazing job of doing uh, books on a variety of topics. They're available online. If you want to learn more, we also have several teaching posters. One is on Thanksgiving and fe features corn. Another is on the Zuni waffle gardening, a te technique used at the museum that Christine had mentioned earlier. Um, so here's our cookbook the, on page 26 is the actual recipe and pictures of it. I'm just gonna walk through a little bit of it for you today. Um, so the first step of the salad, you will need to create a vinaigrette, which includes, in this case, canola oil, apple cider, salt, and, vinegar, and pepper. Whisk that in a bowl and set aside for later. Next, cut the two halves of two zucchini in half, two yellow summer squash, and seed them and then add them to a grill pan to get grill marks on them along with the corn. It'll take about 10 minutes for the zucchini and maybe five for the corn. Um, dice the squashes fine and add the corn kernels to a bowl and add the beans. In this case, it can, it can actually be any canned bean. Uh, the recipe in the book refers to a different kind, but any kind will work. And add yellow and red tomatoes and then toss with the dressing to taste and you can serve it at warm or at room temperature. So thank you, Mandy. Thank you, Ooh. Hayes. Uh, that has definitely inspired me to make my own Three Sisters dish. It looks super delicious and also very healthy. <laughs> so I wanted to turn next to Renee because I understand that you grow your own Three Sisters garden and um, have a lot of knowledge that goes with that. And also wondering if you could address another audience question, which was in reference to how Christine mentioned planting in the four directions. And the audience member was wondering, is that something that all tribes do or is it um, maybe specific to certain? So I'm wondering if you could tell us more about the importance of carrying on the tradition of, of growing this garden in your family and the, the cultural knowledge that comes with that. Sure, sure I'd be happy to. So to the four directions, um, you know, I'm not certain if everyone does that. Uh, I think that probably what's, you know, I know some communities talk about the four directions when they grow the corn. Um, we just build mounds and um, I'm aware more of the relationship between the plants themselves. So you want to plant plants on the south side so that they get the most sun and you want to be um, really aware of, you know, shade that's thrown and um, all of these different things. So that's something that we really take into account um, when we're growing our garden at home. And I actually have a couple of pictures of some different corns that we've grown over the years. Um, on the far left, you'll see an ancient corn. And this actually goes back to when uh, Teosente was a wild grass. So about 10,000 years ago, um, at least indigenous peoples have been growing corn and each kernel had its own husk. And through a lot of observation and indigenous knowledge systems and um, life experience, I'm really learning about the plants which have their own innate knowledge too. Um, and working with these daily through life experience, native people, indigenous peoples, particularly from uh, the Tehuacan Valley of Mexico where the oldest corn was found, um, they cultivated this corn over time so that now we have these um, corns where every, uh, you know, the whole cob has husks. So this took many, um, many thousands of years to develop. So we see a few different varieties, um, some types of Shawnee corns that I've been given by uh, community members, as well as a uh, Miamia corn in, in the Miamia language, it's called Minjipe. So we grow these uh, corns and you can show the next slide, please. Um, in our family and, you know, we're kind of learning right along with uh, the, the plants themselves. So we grow them, you know, in our uh, backyard. You you see a picture here of the corn that we're growing this year. It's actually a popcorn and it's from the Cherokee people. 
And I wanted to make the point that uh, indigenous peoples have always traded and shared these crops, that's how they made it all throughout the Americas. So this has always been a, a trade system that's been really important to our people. And uh, I actually learned the word for popcorn recently, and it kind of sounds like like popping corn. So I'm gonna, it's Thoki Skilapothi. And so it sort of sounds like popcorn, but we've got some Cherokee popcorn this year, we've got some pumpkins, and we've got some Scarlet Runner beads. And also my grandfather, this is a few years back, my grandfather, Grandpa Goki, he's got some very tall corn growing, um, some Miamia Minjipe, because he's Sac and Box and, and Miami or Miamia. So he's got some of that growing. And my grandparents have always grown really good gardens on both sides of my family. So we're trying to do it at home. And so my kids and I have been working in the garden together, and it's just a nice way for us to to work together and also learn from the plants themselves. So, thank you, Renee. Um, it's so so nice of you to share those personal examples of how you're carrying on Shawnee traditions and passing them down to your children and all of the knowledge that goes with that. And I know that over the past few months, as people have spent more time at home and had more time to do things like gardening, people are gardening more than ever, um, and even with their families, even better. Christine, would you be able to talk to us about the health benefits of gardening? You know, gardening is one of the top um, hobbies in the country right now, and especially under the current situation where people are staying home more and wanting to um, get back to the earth and grow their own food, and it's, you know, therapy for people too. It's a way of stress relief. It's physical exercise, um, just kind of calming people and grounding them uh, back to the earth um, in a way. Um, the, uh, you know, it's great organic and to know where your food comes from and to grow your own food. It's also um, helpful i mean it's hopeful when you plant these little seeds and then you wait and for them to sprout it's exciting and then seeing the the end result of a huge plant that came from a tiny little seed over the course of a couple of months kind of following the progress and growth of it is a, a great hope, hope and encouragement for people and it can also um be a way to get children more interested in eating their vegetables and and eating healthy food choices Thank you, Christine. I, I think it's a great way to, um, like you said, be outdoors, um, to relieve stress and um, spend time with family and also to see the benefits of um, those plants really coming to life and producing food that's nutritious for us. This has been a really rich discussion that's touched on a lot of the cultural knowledge of planting, harvesting and preparing the Three Sisters, corn, beans and squash as well as the health benefits of gardening and eating those um, foods as well. I think one of the highlights for me of, for working at the National Museum of the American Indian is being able to see and experience the cultural programming that happens throughout the year. And while the museum is closed, we do want everyone to know that we very much look forward to a day when we can be back in the museum and working with tribal community members to share this programming. And we do have a variety of resources that are available online. Um, we have our Native Knowledge 360 education website which um, does go a lot more in depth into South American, um, for example, Inca food cultivations and innovations. I saw that there's a question about um, South America and yes, they do um, cultivate corn, beans and squash and potatoes. And we have a whole online lesson about that. Uh, we also have a lot of our past cultural performances on our website and we'll have upcoming virtual events as well. And Hayes, I was wondering if you could speak more to the types of cultural programming that we have done to highlight the Three Sisters. Food in general, particularly the corn, beans, and the squash. Um, one thing I would like to note is that about 60% of the world's diet today is derived from Native American foods such as potatoes, chilies, tomatoes, pumpkins, corns, beans, squash, and even chocolate. And we've done programs around those. 
a lot of those can be found on the web. Um, we had done a program about food sovereignty, which the three sisters were discussed for the 2018 Living Earth program that is available on the web. And we also work closely with SI Gardens, particularly our Christine, who's here, and Melanie Pyle. And they do a lot of work to help grow, cultivate, and locate the plants that we need to tell the stories of the indigenous people of the Western Hemisphere. Um, we have a couple of images to show here. The first one that's on the screen is our colleague from the Latino Center. It's Emily Key, and she is de demonstrating to a number of children how to make a corn husk doll. And next slide. So, and the next one we have is from a spring program that we had done several years back around corn in the Maya. Juanita Velasco is Maya. She is demonstrating how to make a tortilla in the NMA's outdoor fire pit. And we also had done a spring planting of the NMAI's native croplands with corn. And we did a corn grinding demonstration for that program as well. And then the next image is looking at it from a different perspective. This is an Alfremba de Acerin. It's a carpet made of sawdust. And it's something we've done for several programs. And I believe Folk Life has done it as well. This one is by Ubaldo Sanchez. He's Maya Mam. It was done for a corn program. And if you look at the red border closely, you'll see that it's actually the Mayan glyph for corn. And this last shot is during our Ladybug program. The ladybugs are an instrumental part, as Christine had mentioned, of doing, um, of maintaining pests within the native landscape. And here I am, left holding the bag, and I had to be debugged before I could go back into the building to make sure I didn't take any of the ladybugs who wanted to come with me in. And Renee, you've intrigued me a lot with what you mentioned earlier with the squash, the smoked squash, and the cornbread. I see potential. I'm sorry, Hayes, I missed part of what you said at the end about that. I heard about the smoked pumpkins and the, the cornbread. In your story, you talked about smoke pump, uh, the smoked pumpkin and the, and the cornbread, and I just I see them as possibilities for future programs. Also, popcorn is native, and we actually have Mapuche popcorn poppers in our collection, and they look a little bit like a Jiffy Pop, only made out of clay. <laughs> I love those. Those are some of my favorite objects. Yeah, they're really fantastic. They're old too. Very they old, are. the ceramic, yeah. From the Moche people, I believe. Correct. At least what I've read so far. Well, thank you for um, sharing all of that information. Like I said, we're very much looking forward to getting back to, to the museum, but also want to continue to share programs like this virtually. Um, I think we have a little bit of time for a couple questions if we have any from the audience members i guess one one that came up was uh and maybe christine you might be able to answer this sure. is would the three sisters grow well in drier or more arid climates like texas um yeah, I think it would. Um, there are actually, you know, hundreds of varieties of corn, beans, and squash available, and you could just select a variety that um, likes drier conditions. And the ones we've selected here perform well here, which doesn't mean they would necessarily like the Texas climate. Also, the length of the growing season when you select the seeds, just make sure you get ones that uh, have a longer growing season. If you're in the part of Texas that has a, a longer season than we do. So you could research that and find varieties that would perform well in um, any type of situation, I think. Yeah, that's good to know, just being aware of your climate and where you're living and, and which seeds would grow best there. And really, there's a, a large area throughout um, North, Central, and South America where these um, foods have been cultivated for thousands of years. And Indigenous people really were experts at adapting uh, to the methods and seeds to the those climates and i see a question here from johanna how are these foods stored and preserved throughout the winter would anyone like to tackle that one i i can talk a little bit about um some of the shawnee ways and i think this extends to other communities as well um, you know, we braid the husks and they can be hung from the um, homes and 
in the case of uh, Shawnee homes, you know, traditionally they were a long, long time ago, Wiggy was, and then uh, Shawnee people started living in log cabins with contact pretty early on. So they'd be hung from the rafters and also um, dried on, on mats or on roofs. And uh, actually one Shawnee wo woman, an elder told me about how she'd have to, her job, her brother would kind of hoist her up onto the um, roof and then she'd actually rub her hand over the corn and turn it over. And that would help to dry it. And then they were probably put in um, baskets and different types of things for the winter and stored that way in containers and and that's so important to keep them dry um, because plants will mold and then you know if you don't know how to do it properly you'll lose a lot of the the crop so that's really important too is knowing how how to care for them after you've um, removed them thanks renee this has been so informative and i think a big takeaway from from me is just the difference in in the varieties and climate and and the care and knowledge that really has to go into um, planting and, and growing and harvesting the three sisters so i do want to thank everyone we're we're at time here so thank you very much to our guest speakers today christine price abelo Hayes Levis and Renee Goki. And thanks to everyone participating, all those who watched, listened, and commented. And I want to close by offering a special thanks to Elisa Huff, Sarah Rothman, Ginny Maycock, Diane Nutting, Alex Tiger, and Sabrina Lynn Motley for their production, promotion, and administrative efforts. We'd also like to thank our program content team, Arlene Reiniger and Betty Belenas. By Lou Boudelon, and also thanks for help with publicity from Maria Alvarez, Lisa Austin, and Cynthia Brown. And special thanks to Freddie Batsui, executive chef of the Mitzi Tem Cafe at the National Museum of the American Indian. Please follow the Smithsonian Folklife page here on Facebook to get notifications about future events, and find us also on Instagram at Smithsonian Folklife and YouTube. Visit our websites and come back here for our next program. Thank <laughs> you.